before we start, I just wanted to say that the UK is beginning at the first day of mourning following the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Some of the scheduled speakers may no longer be able to join for some of the sessions later in the day. Um, we take inspiration from her public service um, and uh, bring that with us as we move through the conference sessions today. Um, but I'm very thrilled. Um, to, to bring together a great group of uh, scholars and practitioners in this academic symposium, the title of which is Governance and Institutional Logics in Outcome-Focused Partnerships. This is a hybrid session, uh, so a particular welcome to those joining us online through Zoom, and a big hello to those who have joined us bright and early in Oxford at the Blavatnik School. So in this session, we have five presentations. Um, because they were all great papers and we saw connections in terms of the themes, we wanted to squeeze them all into this one hour session, but it does mean that we're tight on time. So we have asked each of the speakers to keep their presentation to five minutes. We're planning to run the presentations consecutively. So you can post questions in the chat as we go. And then in the second half, we'll move into more of a discussion to pick up on some of the shared themes and points of intersection between the papers. So please do post your questions and comments and reflections in the chat on Zoom, and we will aim to integrate these in the discussion. You can also use the chat to raise any technical issues if there are any questions around the sound quality. Um, this session is being recorded and it will be available online afterwards as well. So don't feel like you've got to take too many notes. Um, so in this session, we're hearing a few sort of academic presentations, but you'll know at the Social Outcomes Conference, we really aim for a dialogue between practitioners and scholars. And so I just wanted to offer a slightly crude one minute explainer on two of the terms that I think are useful in connecting these papers. So just to demystify in case anyone is unfamiliar with these terms. So term one, institutional logics. Uh, Crudely, I see this as a framework for understanding institutions and organizational behavior. So you can think of an institutional logic as a set of practices, the kind of symbolic systems that might be assumptions, it might be values or beliefs which guide individuals and organizations and bring meaning to their daily activity. So impact bond projects often feature partnerships uh, that involve the collaboration of stakeholders from different sectors who bring different institutional logics. And the second concept is that of welfare regimes or welfare traditions. So this is a, a very widely used concept in the social sciences. It's a framework that helps us understand different types of welfare states. Um, one of the most famous frameworks is that of Esping Anderson, who's got this kind of three worlds of welfare capitalism. And he suggests that welfare regimes can be broadly classified within uh, three categories. So we have liberal regimes uh, with lower levels of state intervention, more of a reliance on market forces. So you can think Australia, the US, the UK, we have um, conservative or conservative corporatist regimes such as Italy, France and Germany, and we have a number of speakers from Germany with us today. And then we have a, a, a social democratic regime, which you can understand as maybe the more interventionist end of the spectrum, guaranteeing universal basic benefits at more generous levels. And here people typically think of the Scandinavian states of Sweden, Norway and Denmark. Importantly, this is not the only way to think about uh, welfare tradition, and some of our presenters may wish to push back on some of this as we go. But you'll see that impact bonds have been implemented across a range of different welfare regimes. This might potentially influence how the different logics play out in the impact bond. And in this session, we really hope to explore perhaps some of the tensions between different institutional logics how these are mitigated within, within an impact bond partnership and using this comparative lens of welfare regimes across Europe. So with that in, uh, in hand, um, I'd love to pass the mic to Cornelia Nissing. So Cornelia is project manager in the Bertelsmann Sifsung Sustainable Social Market Econ Economies Programme. 
sorry if my pronunciation is dodgy there, and you have a focus on uh, impact and innovation, and you have results from two impact bonds in Germany. So over to you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to share some of the key results of um, two recently completed social impact bond pilots in Germany. And yeah, my name is Cornelia Nissink. I'm working at Bertelsmann Stiftung. Uh, in the impact investing team. The Bettelsmann Stiftung is a private operating um, foundation, what means that um, in, um, in contrast to a grant making foundation, we design and initiate our projects ourselves. Um, the impact investing team has been involved in the field of impact investing uh, already um, for about 10 years, and most recently as a practical tester of um, social impact bonds. Um, there has been a total of three social impact bonds in Germany so far. The first um, being the JUMP social impact bond in southern Germany in the field of youth employment, followed by the two pilots initiated by the Bertelsmann Stiftung um, together with Fineo, um, a non-profit consultant, a consultant um, organization that functioned as the intermediary um, in the two ZIP pilots. In the next slide, um, we can see <clears throat> that the first pilot was about prevention and family assistance uh, in, in, yeah, in the northwest uh, of Germany um, that was launched in 2017 and was just finished in July this year. The goal was to pilot the evidence-based parenting program Triple P as a more effective and quick family assistance intervention than conventional, more invasive ones. This pilot was implemented in the area of um, statutory service provision, uh, yeah, which might be interesting for the further um, discussion. Uh, in the end, 33 families in need of individual assistance due to family-related challenges uh, were provided with the new um, parenting program. There was a capacity for 48 uh, families, but it turned out that suitable cases were rarer than previously assumed. But from these 33 families in need of individual um, um, help, um, two thirds improved the situation um, in a sustainable and measurable way. <clears throat> That means that they uh, didn't need any um, help in the follow-up period of one year after the end of the training, um, and that there's an improvement of the child's or children children's behavior and um, the parenting skills. Our model-based calculation of the new intervention indicated that almost half of the costs in comparison to the conventional intervention uh, could be saved for the public authority in this case. <clears throat> and another success is that um, Triple P has already been integrated in the regular range of family assistance services and further families are already provided with the new family assistance service. In the next slide, um, we see that the second social impact bond was about strengthening educational opportunities for children um, in the city of Mannheim in the middle of Germany. And it was also in place from 2017 to 2022. It just finished with the end of the school year um, in this summer. The goal was to pilot the integrative campus Pestalozzi School as an additional needs-based support program for pupils with educational disadvantages due to their origins. The ZIP was implemented in the area of voluntary services. Um, as it was an intervention that goes beyond the basic schooling. There were two cohorts of primary school children um, <laughs> provided with um, this uh, program, uh, and in particular pu pupils with migrant um, backgrounds who are at risk of poor educational performance due to uh, language difficulties. Unfortunately, from early 2020, the COVID-19 um, pandemic, uh, had huge con consequences on schooling in Germany. So the impact measurement could not be conducted as planned um, anymore. And because no one knew at that point um, how the pandemic would affect the world, it was agreed that the repayment uh, would be independent of the impact 
um, of the intervention. So the, the city of Mannheim is the public commissioner um, and the investor, in this case it was the BASF um, chemistry um, company, agreed to have the cost of the intervention. However, the qualitative evaluation was continued and indicated um, that there was an improvement uh, of German math and also social skills of the pupils um, based on several surveys um, of the teachers and other persons involved. And um, those elements of the campus that were shown to have a positive impact um, according to the evaluation uh, were continued at the school and drawn up, uh, drawn upon the city of um, Mannheim in its wider work um, in the field of education. Yeah, and I will be happy to share more aspects about the um, social impact one pilot, um, especially by contrasting um, the area of statutory and uh, voluntary service provision in the further discussion. Thank you so much, Cornelia. Um, I'd now like to pass to our, our second presenters. So Antonia Moore is a PhD student at the Vienna University of Economics and Business, and her research has a focus on comparative welfare states, uh, thinking about philanthropy and social innovation. And Julia Bahlmann, uh, also a PhD candidate in management at the University of St. Gallen. Um, and your presentation, Welfare States Between Tradition and Innovation, think will reflect on the more hesitant development of impact bonds in Germany and will pick up on some of these themes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the introductory words. I'm Antonia, I'm a PhD student. I would just start my PhD in fall and in my master thesis I focused on the social impact bonds in Germany and that's the study we are building on right now in our research project which focused on the influence of the German welfare state characteristics on the implementation of innovative finance instruments and therefore we are using the example of social impact bonds. And our starting point goes back to 2020 when Julia and I worked on the German market study of the impact investing market. And thereby we got to know Cornelia and the concept of social impact bonds. And we thought this is an innovative tool to foster the collaboration of public sector actors, of private actors. It's a way to tackle social challenges and also to promote the idea of impact investing. But looking at the German landscape of social impact bonds, this picture is less promising with three social impact bonds implemented, which are more like pilots. And so far as we know, no further impact bonds planned. And our assumption was that this resistant development can partly be explained by the German welfare state characteristics of a conservative or corporatist model, which Eleanor explained before. And also we thought that maybe the clash of different logics, like the logics of public sector actors, of private actors, third sector actors can have an challenging influence, or it was another idea, can foster change in logics, so can maybe foster a further development of the welfare state. And uh, from this twofold research interest, our twofold theoretical perspective arises. Oh, you can go one slide further. Okay, great. So that's our research design. And uh, yeah, our theoretical lens is on the one hand, welfare state theories, and on the other hand, the institutional logic perspective, which makes it possible for us to understand the different logics of the actors involved to understand what a clash of these logics can lead to and what complexity comes with along with that and also we are focusing on institutional entrepreneurs which is a concept where individuals drive change and we wanted to find out if there are like institutional entrepreneurs in the german system who can like foster a development and our method is that we are following a qualitative approach. So far, we've conducted 10 expert interviews with persons who are or were involved in a SIP, and thereby we try to have representatives from the public sector, from the private sector, and from the shared sector. And uh, yeah, we want to broaden our data set with further interviews, but due to the limited implementation, our data set is limited to just a few people. That's why we are thinking of including further data, like reports and studies on the feasibility of uh, SIPs in Germany. Yeah, but we have some first results from the first 10 interviews we made and uh, Julia will present them in a minute. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm happy to share some of the key results um, that we found so far. So first of all, our results show that SIPs um, pose a challenge for the um, 
German welfare state in the establishment and implementation stage. So based on our um, analysis, we identified structural and cultural problems that are hindering the further development. So structural, on the structural level, we see multi-level problems due to the subsidiarity principle in Germany, um, as well as we are facing financial problems um, from the public sector, from investors. So the question, who's beneficial, who pays for the cost, is difficult sometimes to distinguish, also due to the investor culture that is in Germany quite based also on foundations like the Bertelsmann Foundation. Um, and these um, yeah, structures also face difficulties as uh, foundations have difficulties with returns and um, yeah, also the governments um, don't receive the long-term money. So there's a uh, yeah, co complex system. Um, another thing that we focus on is the clash of different logics. Um, that increase the complexity within the situation. However, this could be more or less balanced out due to intermediary structures that interviews told us. So um, this is a, if we increase the transparency and communication issues, put more expertise in it um, and focus on this, this could be a lower down a little. And the last point we, we made is that the uh, narratives of SIPs are insufficiently clarified at the moment. So are SIPs needed in Germany? And if so, which function do they really fulfill? So there needs to be a joint debate among all stakeholders together um, that we, we can focus on. I think you also, we can take more details later on in the, also because uh, the UK government also or you focus in one of your papers also on different narratives. So this would be interesting to see um, your points on this view. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Antonia and Julia. Um, next, we will hear about the controversial relationship between public value and social impact bonds with insights from an Italian social innovation program. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Luigi Corvo, uh, an associate professor in business and economics. And I gather that um, Dr. Lavinia Pastore, a co-author of Luigi's and co-founder of Open Impact has also joined us online. So uh, Luigi, uh, a, a five minute presentation on, uh, on your work would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our paper is fo focusing on this controversial relation, no? social impact and public value. Um, our, <clears throat> if you go, can go on with the presentation, please. Um, and we are, we are asking if uh, these two concepts are convergent and under which conditions this can be uh, convergent. Uh, I will not go uh, on literature because we don't have so much time, but let me um, underline one point um, that we found uh, with this research that there is maybe a misunderstanding between the concept of public value and the concept of the value of the public. Uh, if we can go on, please. Uh, this is our field of research. Um, it is an Italian, let's say, impact capacity building program, uh, a program issued by the Italian Presidency of Council of Ministries, um, a three-year program where the local municipalities are <clears throat> uh, uh, engaged in order to create a local ecosystem by um, involving uh, a multi-stakeholder ecosystem and uh, through this ecosystem they should follow a three-year uh, timeline where in the first year their objective is to carry out a feasibility study this feasibility study um, the contents of this feasibility study regards the impact framework then the capacity of making sa some savings or making, um, let's say, uh, understanding how cashable is this uh, impact uh, in order to establish uh, an experimentation uh, by involving also a private funder. Then in the third year, if this kind of mechanism uh, works, uh, a, SIB can be, uh, a social impact bond can be established. Please. 
our research method was mainly a research ethnography. Uh, we were directly involved within this program. Uh, I was and I am advisor for the Italian government for the social innovation program. Uh, and this kind of um, activity was uh, carried out uh, by a, a continuous uh, engagement, a continuous work, laboratory work with uh, local municipalities, private stakeholders involved and private funders. Um, the policy flow that we uh, tried to establish, trying to, to create an empathic uh, environment with the stakeholders, um, was aimed at, at uh, engaging stakeholders in order to create um, a, a, let's say, plural uh, convenient about uh, the, the, the social impact culture. Please, if we can go on. The main findings are the following. Um, the first issue was that we leave a contradiction within the semantic between different stakeholders. Um, so what is exactly impact? What is exactly outcome? Uh, when can we say that an, an impact has been achieved? Uh, so this was our first main goal during the first year to uh, align, uh, to harmonize the, the semantic among stakeholders. Uh, then, how to change the, the policy design, uh, introducing the impact thinking perspective. Um, and then also, this has some, <clears throat> some, some uh, implications in terms of technical issues. Um, and then <clears throat> how to make these impact, uh, how, how to make the visualization of this impact very clear for all the different uh, stakeholders. Um, do you see from this scheme that uh, it was very immediate when some income generating activities, the IGA, IGA, were conducted because their result is measurable in terms of revenues and it produces financial value. Uh, when we have uh, outcomes, social outcomes and the result is a social value, it is more difficult to be visualized. So we try to find, to find that intersection between the social value generation and the financial value generation. I'm closing the last slide, please. Okay, um, so this contradiction among public value and value of the public is something that regards the nature, the essence of the role of the government. Uh, the value of the public is the, the value owned by public administration. The public value is a common. That's the main difference we found. Um, and then how can we imagine that public officers that were thought within the framework of the cutback management now can become a uh, thinker of new, a new in investments wave. Um, I would uh, stop here my presentation. And obviously if you have uh, comments, I am very happy. Thank you. Many thanks, Luigi. Um, I'd now like to pass to Dr. Alec Fraser. Alec, thank you so much for joining us at another Social Outcomes Conference. I'm always excited to hear about your latest research. Um, Alec, you were a lecturer at King's Business School, uh, and I understand that you are investigating the use of outcomes-based contracts in the implementation of more effective HIV services. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Al. And uh, yeah, lovely to be here. So exactly. That's what we're, we're trying to do with this paper. It's much more of an empirical paper. Uh, so there's not too much theory in this one, which is good because I've only got five minutes. So I'll try and try and get through. So this is work I've done with a colleague of mine, Claire Kultas from King's as well. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so and if you just point through to the four points, so I've done it in. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's a bit. Yeah. So. Um, 
background is we um, have conducted a service evaluation looking at the Elton John AIDS Foundation um, social impact bond, uh, which is trying to reduce um, HIV prevalence um, and infection rates in South London. So for those who don't know, the, the project ran for three years between 2018 and 2021. So quite difficult years for, for COVID reasons. Uh, and the aim really was to increase um, detection um, in um, a &E services and GP services and, and the key thing was having uh, an opt-out um, blood test so rather than getting um, asking people can we do um, a, a blood test and, and uh, look for HIV uh, they would just they would do it and, and it's you know there's good evidence that leads to uh, more uh, diagnoses. Our work was a kind of a mixed methods uh, approach um, so we've got some descriptive statistics and a number of interviews. Um, the the work is is published on our on our website. There's a there's a link here. Um, so if anyone's interested, you can you can go and go and read about the service evaluation yourself. Um, we were funded by King's Business School, and we got support from the local uh, South London ARC. Um, so in terms of the findings, if you go to the next slide, please. Findings are really, really positive. Okay, so more than 400 people were um, identified, uh, either new diagnoses or lost to follow-up patients. So patients who we know have got HIV but had fallen out of um, NHS services uh, were, were kind of brought back into the services. So it, it, it worked very, very effectively. Um, and, and so why, why, did it, why did it work so well? Um, and, and a lot of the reasons, a lot of the problems we've had in uh, NHS HIV services are linked to kind of siloed funding where different, different parts of the NHS kind of bigger structure pay for prevention or pay for treatment and they don't really kind of talk to each other and match up. What really was effective in, in this project was, was getting them all to kind of work together. So we got better interorganizational um, working across different organizations, really, really strong leadership uh, from, from the Elton John AIDS Foundation themselves. Uh, you know, these are things we see in lots of lots of SIBs really well, you know, increased data. Uh, was seen as a positive thing, much more flexible financing, um, which was, again, you know, seen as, as something people really liked. Um, there were some negatives as well, which you can kind of see from the report. I think for some of the community providers, they faced some troubles where they were accused of kind of double dipping, where they're already being paid for one service, and then they're getting money from the SIB. And it was really difficult because of COVID. Um, but, you know, this is one SIB which I think really flourished through COVID. And it was through that flexibility of saying, well, People aren't going to the accident and emergency department anymore because of COVID. How can we still reach out and try and get those, those patients who've been lost to follow up? Um, and so, yeah, it, it was very effective um, in, in, in many ways. Okay, so final slide, if we just go into the implications and next steps. Um, so to answer the question, the simple question, um, yes, I think this service evaluation shows that outcomes-based contracts can lead to uh, better implementation of, of, of stronger, more effective HIV services. In the academic work we're doing, uh, we're, we're drawing on some of uh, Dan Schroeder's work, thinking about um, improving implementation. And essentially, what I think we see with this project is the outer context, the, the links between all the different organizations, increased cosmopolitanism, uh, people working together. I think that's what really led to these changes. In terms of wider impacts, we, we've already seen that um, NHS um, England have taken um, a lot of learning from this work, and I think we're going to see improvements, increased um, testing in emergency departments going forward. Um, as ever, I think there's a, a lot more research we need to do here. So the, the health economics work hasn't been done on this. So we suspect it's been um, it's been effective, but we, we don't know. So there's some work to do there. Question marks about how you transfer this from a kind of high prevalence HIV area like South London. Would it work in, in, in areas with uh, lower prevalence? And finally, the thing that I'm really interested in is, is sustainability. And, and what I hope to do is come back a year from now having done another round of interviews because the SIB money is gone now. So what I think is really interesting is, do we still see these improvements a year on, two years on? Um, so that's what, that's the kind of the next stage for, for us anyway, um, seeing what happens after the SIB's gone. Uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you for keeping to time, Alec, um, and giving us such a great flavour of your research. Um, I'll, I'll now hand over to GoLab's own Francisca Rosenbach. Uh, Francisca is research associate and leads a lot of our qualitative research, particularly on the Kirklees Better Outcomes Partnership. Thanks, Francie. Thank you so much.
much. I'm just going to take this. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so um, the recent question for this study is how governance acts as a moderator to institutional pluralism in public service networks. And um, as Elle already indicated, this research is part of a broader longitudinal study examining um, the mechanism and impacts of the Kirkley's Better Outcomes Partnership SIP. And actually, uh, two of my colleagues uh, who were heavily involved in the research are also in the room. So this is Fernando and Elle. And um, so the um, KBOP SIP, it is um, just a bit of context. It is Europe's largest SIP based in the UK. The service aims to improve Next slide, please. Um, the service aims to improve accommodation, employment, stability, and well-being outcomes for vulnerable adults to allow them to manage independent living. This service is in operation since three years, and the service is managed by an investor-owned social prime entity and delivered by eight VCSE organizations. So um, primary data sources steam from 32 expert interviews, including the investors, subcontract managers, um, provider and um, council managers. Data were coded using a mixed inductive deductive strategy. So the first stage of analysis aimed to validate the assumption um, that the market and the community logic were competing in the SIP partnership. And then the second stage of analysis aimed to identify the SIP's response to logic multiplicity using the lens of organizational governance. Um, more specifically, it, aimed, um, it examined how did governance structure, processes, and members feature a practice of logic integration, differentiation, or a combination of both. So um, next slide, please. So um, findings suggest competing um, practices emanating from the payment by result contract nature and the person-led delivery approach. So the merge of the two, two concepts resulted in conflicting demands and practices related to the basis for strategy and the basis of attention. Um, the payment by result nature of the contract is um, underpinned by efficiency consideration with a considerable increase in frontline staff caseloads and a strong focus on performance targets reflective of the market logic. In contrast, the concept of personalization is guided by user responsiveness and facilitating frontline discretion in service provision linked to the community logic. Next slide, please. Um, so this table provides a very dense summary of the uh, study results. So the study suggests that the market logic and the community logic coexist in the KBOP SIP. It identifies governance as a mean to balance prescriptions from different institutional logic through a combination of logic integration and differentiation. Central was the hybrid profile of the SIP contract manager, so its professional experience as a SIP contract manager, as well as in the VCC sector, gave it the leg legitimacy and trust across the provider and investor fund managers to introduce governance processes um, responding to the demands of both logics. In terms of the governance processes, the contract manager used a mix of control and empowerment oriented processes. So the control-oriented um, agency approach tailoring efficiency demand of the market logic and um, the empowerment-oriented agent uh, processes facilitated greater, greater provider discretion and service delivery as endorsed by the community logic. So for example, limited financial decision-making power was devolved to the front line to the setup of um, a personalization fund. And then briefly to um, the board. So this was more characterized by a logic differentiation approach. The board composition and role and distribution of decision making power indicated an association with the market logic. Next slide, please. So um, I think the study underlines the importance of pluralist managers um, to mitigate tensions and create a unifying force across providers for delivery under a um, BR arrangement. I think there is um, further investigation needed um, on boards dynamics um, to examine whether and how supports maintain an intention to boss logic. And um, of course, this is a single case study research. So I guess there is a further in-depth research needed to explore the different dimension of SIP logics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francisca. Um, 
We'll be opening up for questions, comments, and reflections now from the floor. Um, but on the next slide, um, you'll see a, a few different um, themes and questions that we asked the panelists to reflect on in advance of the session. Um, I'm particularly keen to hear from um, Julia and Antonia around their reflections on these different welfare traditions. So thinking about the German case and the degree to which that has informed um, the implementation of impact bonds, I'm particularly struck by the separation of experience between statutory services where an impact bond has been introduced and those beyond what might be uh, considered statutory support. So any reflections on those themes? I think the second point is more for you as you have the direct experience with this comparison of the two steps. But maybe on the first point, as we already pointed out, we see these difficulties on the cultural and on the structural level. But I think some of the structural problems are problems we always have with SIPs, like they are more related to the instrument, so not that much related to the conservative welfare state. But I think especially cultural problems are quite particular for the German welfare state as a conservative one, because SIPs are always complex, they are always like new for Germany and they always, um, I always have to do a lot of effort to implement them. And I think when you also have to do all these emotional work to convince critical actors, it's a lot of effort. And I'm not really sure who will be the motivated individuals who take all this effort on the practical side and also this effort on the cultural side to convince these actors, especially looking at third sector organizations who maybe have some skepticism over these new instruments. Another point I would like to add is uh, the question of necessity or the issue of necessity. So uh, we do have quite in Germany a wide philanthropic investor network that uh, fund, uh, fund social issues and uh, needs. So um, yeah, then there's a question if we kind of not overfunded but have enough money but still innovation is missing. Um, also, the state is, has the option to borrow money. Um, what are we doing if we have these possibilities? And at the same time, we have SIPs who um, yeah, go along with a certain return. And uh, this just raises the question of necessity. Thank you. Cornelia, would you like to pick up on those points? Yes. Um, yeah, one point to the emotional work. So we talked to a lot of um, municipal representative and yeah, try to convince them to to try with us um, social impact bond pilots. And um, yeah, it was a hard job. <laughs> um, in the end, we had these two um, pilots, but we also uh, did a lot of feasibility studies that um, yeah did not lead to a social impact bond. Um, and also, yeah, the other point is that there are um, less expensive instruments. So the um, the the uh, necessity for a social impact bond and the use case for a social impact bond, um, yeah, is uh, is very specific. Um, and what what I would like to um, uh, yeah to share from the um, practical um, side is that. Um, yeah, we are um, like a conservative, uh, or we have a conservative welfare system, and um, the social sector um, is regulated by the social code. And um, with regards to the the pilots, um, for us, this had advantages and also disadvantages. So um, the advantages were, for example, in the family assistance um, social impact bond, that um, we could build upon um, processes that are in place already. Um, for example, this was the case for the referrals of the families to the program. Um, and on the other hand, yeah, it's important to um, to guarantee the rights and entitlements of the target group, in this case, the families um, yeah, that, that they have. Um, and that's sometimes um, a little bit um, tricky. And moreover, I think that's also um, like the emotional work. There are already long established um, stakeholders and players um, who don't necessarily accept new players in the field and um, especially not <clears throat> especially not um, investors um, yeah I stop here thank you thank you and um, I'd like to ask whether there are any questions or comments from the floor in the room we do have a couple of questions online as well and um, but Carolyn I have a question for Alec. Um, so I thought your your last point was 
really important, profound that, you know, once the SIP funding is removed, will the um, project still sustain like the services and infrastructure? I'm curious to know, like, based on your study thus far, what would you be looking for in terms of signals? Like, do you feel like the collaborations that were built were strengthened through the SIB? Um, were there new things in place that they wouldn't want to see go away? So what is your prediction and why? <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, Thank you, Carolyn. Um, yeah, no, I think that I, I, this is what I'm really interested in. And, and, and I think, Again, what what really worked here, what really worked well here, are, are the things that we've seen from other from other SIBs. So, um, actually having enough money to to deliver a service properly. I can see Neil as well, who I might ask to come in because he's also done a lot of work on on, on this one. So, if there's anything I miss, um, so yeah, will the same amount of funding be in place? Um, I suspect it won't. Um, so, so that's that's a key thing. Uh, one of the big things with this was you shifted from um, just giving us a, a standard amount of money for, for doing an HIV uh, test uh, to paying quite a substantial amount of money for every um, every case which was found. I don't think the, the NHS has got the capacity or, or the, the, the finances to, to be able to do that. So I, I think it, it could be a struggle for, for, for those reasons. Um, however, the, the collaboration which was set up by the SIB, um, I would hope that that would endure. Um, you know, you've got um, you've, you've got organisations which haven't worked together that well historically who really have come together over this. The local authorities, the NHS, um, primary care kind of working very closely. Um, if those links can be kept up, then that would be that would be fantastic. But that will also come down to kind of leadership, which I know is something that, that, that you're also interested in. What we saw in this case was a really quite quite dynamic, quite forceful figure in the centre there working for, for the SIB. Um, but interestingly, that person has gone on to work for the NHS now. Um, and so, so in terms of kind of longer term collaborations, longer term thinking, the fact that that institutional knowledge hasn't been lost um, is potentially um, something really, really quite positive. Um, so, so those are the kind of things I think we'll be, we'll, we'll be looking for. Um, but yeah, time, time will tell. Thank you. We actually have an online question and then we have another one in the room. Um, so Russ Wood, uh, I gather that you're joining us from Australia. Um, so thank you for handling the time difference. Uh, it would be great if you could um, pose your question. Sure, no worries. Yes, uh, it's easy at this hour. It's um, it's in, in the evening time, so it's okay for me. Firstly, a, a comment, if I may, um, just on, on uh, the welfare traditions here. I think in Australia, the, the, the interesting thing is that there are jurisdictions, state jurisdictions, which uh, have been far more interested in taking up uh, outcomes-based contracting social impact bonds than others. Um, New South Wales, uh, you've had a couple of speakers uh, yesterday from New South Wales has been far uh, far more willing to take these on than, than the other states. So I think it's there's an interesting question even within a country uh, that there can be quite a variation in, in attitudes towards these instruments. Um, but my question um, is, is again to Alec, uh, one of the challenges we've found with, with the SIB mechanism in the health area is that often interventions take a long time for, uh, for it's often a long time for the savings that are created from health-based interventions to wash through. And by the time you set up a, a financial model with, with high discount rates, uh, they, they end up being non-viable. Uh, we tried one on uh, diabetes, early intervention diabetes here in Australia, just didn't get up. So I'm just wondering what, what, uh, what are the implications of the HIV SIB that, um, that you noted was a success, might be replicable in other public health areas? Thank you. Um... And again, I might I might actually ask Neil to go in on this uh, because because our, our focus was much more on on the, the the kind of health intervention in this work. Whereas I know Neil's done done a lot more work than me on on the kind of the, the wider SIB side of this. One thing I would say, and, and maybe Neil can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. I think this is really quite a unique one in terms of how it came about, um, who was funding it. Um, yeah. By a, a cost benefit case, a, a savings case, they did, they did do one. There's a couple of interesting things there. When the time the research was first done, there's, there was research around that identified the saving. I mean, there is a huge saving, 
because it's somebody who who doesn't get treatment at the right time when their cell count is low has severe risk of getting ill, has severe risk of developing full blown AIDS, and they can also infect other people because they're not aware of their diagnosis. And in 2016, it was put at something like 300,000, I think, per person. And that's come down a lot because of the use of the wider use of generic drugs. And Elton John did their own research. In fact, McKinsey did it for them. It came up with a number of about 140,000. I haven't seen the methodology behind it. But the key point, I think, is that it wasn't the key driver. They, they, they just knew that they would, there would be a significant benefit. The health, the, the health <laughs> commissioners... We're, we're not persuaded, though, by, even by that scale of benefit to invest in it. So the, the, the outcomes pair effectively became Elton John in the end. So you, you, you see that. But they, they never saw it as being primarily driven by that savings case, which I think is slightly unfortunate because it is, it is a huge social and financial benefit of avoidance. Yeah, which is why I think this health economics work really needs to be done. Yeah. Because I think then then you've got a, a stronger case. Um, but it, 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 to go back to the original question, I think it, it, it's really difficult. Um, and I can understand why you, you've struggled with diabetes. Um, the, these things are really, really hard. I mean, we struggle with all of them in the same way it sounds like this. Right? Uh, the, the, the key issue is that, well, certainly in the UK, the health sector has become so strapped for cash that unless the return is literally immediate, they get an immediate return then they just can't invest long term and the other thing is the mismatch that Alec talked about so in theory testing should be paid for by public health which is local government in the UK public health just do not have the budget to do mass testing of people for HIV and that was the key thing that SIB did was just overcome all that wrong pocket problem that we see in so many so many institutions Great. Thank you for, for giving more detail on that. I gather that we have another question in the room. Thank you. This would be a very brief question for any of those who are working on the German SIP case. I was trying to reflect on, you know, other kind of welfare state institutions that may or may not have similar properties. So if I was thinking of Finland, for instance, and the role of Citra in Finland. And I, and I, I was curious if you've had the opportunity yet to kind of reflect on you know, kind of the, the welfare state properties in Germany vis-a-vis -vis some of the other countries that may have also similar well-developed welfare systems and, and see, well, why it might have SIBs developed in one place versus another. Or I don't know if you're there in that, in that part of the, your research. Yeah, maybe I can take on that because that's also something I will focus on my PhD because I think we are comparing really often liberal and conservative welfare states to understand the difference. But I think there's a lot of potential to look at states who have similarities and to understand what went wrong, or what went right there, and to understand how we can push it. That's why we are thinking of including, for example, Austria or the Netherlands, who has not the same welfare system, but there were like similarities more than with the UK, for example. So I think that's a really great approach. Thank you. I wonder if I could bring Luigi in on the on to reflect on some of these themes. Um, Luigi, I wonder whether you could think about the your particular welfare tradition and the tension that you describe between the social value and financial value considerations in your example. Yes, I, hello. I am Lavinia, the co-author of Luigi. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, perfect. And we can see you too. Thank you for okay. joining us, Lavinia. Perfect. So I will answer so that I can also share um, a bit of this session. And thank you for the for the question. I think that uh, well, we have a very um, strong welfare tradition, even if it has changed a lot in the last uh, let's say twenty years. But uh, our problem is that if we think, for instance, uh, uh, to the welfare tradition related to the health sector. Uh, then we see that uh, this is very related to regional government. So we don't have the same way and the same rules for um, the health sector uh, within different regions, for instance. Or and, and since the program that we describe, they have uh, actions that are related to, for instance, social and health services, but we have also services related to culture, or to inclusion, 
So we there we see a broader, broader different different kinds of um, welfare services. Therefore, even if we have a, a specific welfare model, uh, this this welfare model has changed a lot during the years, and we find different situations and uh, different also kinds of tensions because, of course, there are many. Uh, according to the sector, let's say, or the kind of service in which we are. For instance, I, I would say that in the health sector, we have much more tensions uh, because it's something that is, is still perceived as something that should be fully public. Therefore, an experimentation uh, with a SIB or this kind of structure could be seen as something that it creates attention. Uh, other sectors are more. Uh, open and more used to uh, also partnership. Therefore, mm, for instance, in the program that we are studying, most of the experimentation are related to uh, um, inclusion services related to children or to uh, migrants. Th those are the, mm, the main topic that they are elaborating. What I think it's interesting if is to see if after this program, because when uh, Luigi was presenting, we are in the middle, okay? So we are in the phase two of the program. Therefore, we haven't seen yet which of those experimentation will become a, a SIB and if it's, it is going to be properly a SIB because of our legal constraints as a, um, so, but something related, something that is similar to our SIB or anyway, a con outcome based contract. So we will see which ones are, are going, will emerge and uh, uh, on what uh, topic. Thank you, Lavinia. I think detecting things that might be impact bonds in the future is certainly empirically challenging. Alec, this is something I know that has featured in future research of yours. Do you have any reflections on some of your previous research, indeed working with others in different country contexts on some of these issues? Yeah, thank you. So um, it was really interesting hearing about Germany because we did um, with, with um, Deborah Heavenstone, we did some research looking at SIBs in, in the UK, Netherlands, Switzerland and Germany. Um, and I was really pleased that you said, came to the same conclusions that we did <laughs> about difficulties in Germany. Um, so we use the kind of the welfare conventions approach um, to kind of what we really identified was this tension, which I think you've talked about, between the kind of the civic convention and the financial convention. Uh, and we found that in, in Switzerland and Germany, the, the civic convention was, was really strong uh, and it kind of made that this financial convention very, very difficult for, for those policy entrepreneurs who wanted to, to, to institute it. Um, Netherlands was interesting. It was a bit more of a hybrid um, Whereas with the UK, I think it does fit into that more kind of liberal um, kind of classic uh, classic approach. And I think the the thing really with, with the, the UK is you know we've we've got this infrastructure, we've got uh, we've got things like the GoLab, we've got you know we've got rate cards that have been accepted, we've got uh, outcomes funds. That that kind of infrastructure is, is there to to empower those who want to go forward with this kind of uh, work to 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 do so. Um, so. So yeah, really interesting hearing about, about Germany. It, it, yeah, really, really good. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Thank you, Claire. Um, it was interesting, I think, to learn a bit more about a governance mechanism as a sort of way to understand whether or not those logics become sort of differentiated or integrated. My question is, can you say a bit more about how those feel different in the actual research, so a differentiation versus an integration? And then I'm curious to know if there's one that's preferred, right? Do we do we want to see an integrative approach or do we want to see a differentiated approach? Um, and in particular, sort of hypotheses on its relationship to ostensibly the outcomes that are delivered through the partnership. Okay. Um, so in terms of yes, how do how do they how they are they played? I mean, I wish sorry. Um, unfortunately, we don't have yet the approval from um, from the interviewees, otherwise I do have beautiful tables in my uh, draft paper. Um, but um, there was like, in terms of, yeah, I was looking, in terms of 
efficiency. So it was strong. It was a narrative thing, I think, coming out. OK, we do have a very strong what we want to see is performance and um, um, and then in terms of the high caseloads. Um, and there was also a question around, do we achieve the long term outcomes? Um, and um, what I do see is um, that there is a tension in terms of, yeah, you can have a lot of people on the service, but are you actually able then, yeah, you can easily achieve these processy outcomes, like well-being achievement, but are you actually able to deliver this person-led support? Um, and um, sorry, could you remind me of your second question again? So do we have a preference for whether or not something is a differentiated sort of appeasement of institutional logics versus something that feels integrated? So is one preferred or is one better than the other? From Well, me personally, of course, I would like to see uh, the wonder of a logic integration. Um, so you can say, of course, there might be a potential voice um, for me taking doing the research. Um, but um, and also, I guess the message from the project itself would be rather like, OK, we are able to integrate logics. Um, yeah, there might be a slight bias in that respect. Thank you. I also saw you, Francisca, taking a lot of notes when leadership came up as a theme. And that seemed to be something that uh, it, it's a, a difficult hat to wear as someone who is uh, sitting at these nodal intersections in an impact bomb project. Do you have any reflections on, on that? Yeah, I mean, that, I think that was coming stri quite strongly out of my uh, research that leadership is so central because it does create like a common purpose across the partnership and that enables identification with the project from stakeholders, especially from providers, because um, if, if you don't have them on board, um, delivery um, will be hard. Um, so, yes, and um, I think definitely there was this, this pluralist um, feature in, in the subcontract manager. Thank you. Uh, no one else has caught my eye in the room, um, but please do raise a hand if you have another question. We have time for just one more. Great. In which case, I get to pose another question to some of the other panellists, because I'd really like further reflections on this challenge of, of leadership in a cross-sectoral partnership and, and the degree to which that um, plays out in your different contexts. <laughs> yeah, I think the leadership, um, the, the function of the intermediary is uh, quite crucial there because um, in our cases, um, they coordinated, the, it was Fineo as uh, in both SIPs, and they coordinated a lot of um, steering committee um, conferences and um, that were the um, situations when yeah all partners came together on a very regular basis and talked about um, how the project is going on or what needs to be um, improved. Um, and they had in mind, yeah, um, how or, or like the benchmarks, what we want to, to achieve and um, all our uh, impact goals, of course. And for example, in, um, in the situation, um, of the early pandemic um, with the second social impact bond that I um, presented, um, which took place in a primary school. Um, yeah, I think it was very important to have somebody who um, tried to figure out all the options and so on. And um, yeah, in the end, we decided for an option that, um, um, yeah, that we were able to take the most uh, control about um, the project because um, yeah in, unfortunately we um, did not measure the impact anymore or we couldn't measure the impact anymore as the pupils were just not in school and when they were at school it was very hard because they had need to um, learn maths or German then and uh, didn't want to do any tests for, to, for us um, yeah so it was very important to have uh, Fineo as an intermediary to yeah, try to, to to find a way there to go on. Thank you. I see you nodding. Would you like to add some comment? Um, yeah, I was also thinking about, we never talked about leadership in Germany. We just talked about intermediary structures, which I think means in the end the same. But I think one problem is that we are missing this 
person or the structure who is driving this on a broader level because we had Fineo, for example, but the pilot is over now and I'm not really sure who will take this role in the future. And there was also a point which came up in our interviews that they say, we all agree we need the structures, but who will be the person for that? Is it a public sector actor? Is it a third sector actor? In the end, we need someone in between, but who is that? So I think we are missing a bit these specific like role model for, for this. Thank you. And I think that's a really helpful reflection to finish on, actually. So thank you, everyone, for joining us in this session. Thank you very much to our panellists. Thank you for joining us online. Our next session starts at uh, 9.30, where we have concurrent roundtables. In Lecture Theatre 1, we have uh, evidence and practical insights from the UK's Life Chances Fund projects. And in Lecture Theatre 2, Balancing Act, measuring what matters in outcomes-based partnerships. I hope to see you in one of those. Thank you very much.